So this morning we have we have a kind of a more of acoustic set this morning for singing. Um, so that means we need crowd participation. <laughs> we need you guys to sing with us because he's worthy, right? He's so worthy. So if you guys would please stand. We're gonna sing a song of freedom.
guys be seated this morning. At all. Again, welcome officially to everybody that's gathered. I, I just can't tell you uh, as far as the staff and the leadership and, and even the, the, uh, the, the regular family here that we have. It is just, uh, I, I just still can't understand um, how and why God does what he does. And to see folks coming in that we don't know that we're just meeting for the first time, um, it's, just, it's just incredible. And it reminds us of that need that exists for all of us for a Savior. And this time of season has a way of, of reminding folks of that. I just want to remind you, especially if you're visiting, let you know what we're doing. We're in the, the, about the first third of a series called Core 52. We're studying just 52 simple verses, concepts, principles from across the whole spectrum of the Bible. We start in Genesis and we're working our way through really all the way in to Revelation at the very end. And each week is a different core principle. We got two more weeks here and then we're going to take a little break for Christmas and then be back at it to start the new year. But if you're just joining us, uh, outside on that table right behind the sound booth are a stack of, of Core 52 books. Those are free to you if you would like to take one to join us on this journey. This week we are in week 14, week 14 on our journey together. So please take one of those devotion books with you. Uh, you start reading it on Monday each week. Chapter 14 is where we're at. And then there's five days worth of devotions or passages or things to do throughout the week. So it's Monday through Friday. We would love to, love to, love to have you join us on this journey. For those of you that have been here since the beginning of this journey in September, we ordered at least 230 of those books, and I think we're down to about eight that we've given out, all the rest of those. And so whether everyone's here on the same, if all of those people would come at the same time, oh my goodness, I'd be, I, I, I'd be the first one to give up my seat and stand, okay? I absolutely would, and hopefully several of you would too. Uh, we've all stood in line for longer than an hour in life, haven't we? And we were accomplishing nothing but standing in line. Okay, some of us have stood in line for three hours or longer to just ride a stupid ride that lasted about probably three minutes. Yes, we've done it and we'll do it again, won't we? Anyway, so, so join us in that, would you? All right, let's go to Lord in prayer and then we'll dive into God's word today. Father, uh, open, your, open our minds, open our hearts to your word this morning. Father, we know there's many people that have gathered today in person and online. We, we don't know who will end up watching this one day. And they, they sit down thinking they're watching it for this reason. But in reality, you have a much more specific reason. People might have gathered here today because a, a certain person in their family invited them or they just were looking for a different church and they, they come here. But Father, you have a very specific reason why they're here today. Would you please reveal that to them? And for those of this, this is our home. This is our family. We're here each and every week. Sometimes that can become routine. Father, you brought each and every one of us here today for a very specific reason. It might be a song. It might be a prayer. It might be a passage. It might be because we're supposed to be the ones to introduce ourselves to one of those new people. It might be because we're supposed to go and, and pray with someone who has come today who's struggling mightily with the weight of this world. Every one of us has a role here to play. Make it known. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Proverbs 1.7. You don't really need to turn there because it's just one verse and we'll be around other places of the Bible. That is our core verse for today. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Would you agree with me that maybe today there's a bit of a short supply of wisdom in the world? Yeah. The society that we live in, we have more information, more knowledge, if you will, at our fingertips than is even possible for any generation prior to us to even dream about. But that knowledge, that information doesn't seem to be leading to more wisdom, does it? Hmm, I wonder why. If you turn on the news for more than 30 seconds, you're going to hear a little foolishness. I guarantee it. H have you ever been on Facebook? <laughs> Do I even need to mention TikTok? Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> I mean, foolishness is everywhere. We, we, <laughs> we can easily broadcast that across the entire globe now. It's amazing. We used to be able to keep that kind of internal and just a few people knew how foolish we were. But now, now we can let everybody on planet Earth know exactly 
where we're at. To begin today, I remember after reading this passage, I wanted to find, I wanted to find a great secular definition of wisdom, a great secular resource for me to look at and compare it to God's word. And wouldn't you know, I didn't have to look far. Psychology Today actually had an article this October about wisdom, and it provided exactly what I needed. It gave me 10 sources. Psychology Today gave me 10 sources of wisdom, according to to psychology today's perspective. I'm going to read the list to you. It's a much longer article. I summarized just the list. Here is what psychology today will tell you are the 10 greatest sources of wisdom. Open-mindedness, empathy, self-reflection, a balanced approach to life, if you will, being able to manage uncertainty, wisdom that comes with aging, Through the mastery of crises, wisdom from seeing the big picture, from having purpose or direction. Finally, wisdom is developed through emotional regulation. The article summed it up all this way at the end. It says, wisdom provides the inner resources to deal with adversity and hardship. Wisdom enables individuals to adjust to life circumstances by thoroughly understanding and accepting themselves, others, and the world. Hmm. Now there are some components of what they listed that are very accurate. That's very much a part of wisdom, but they got the source all wrong. 100%. How on earth do some of those things have anything to do with true wisdom? Well, of course they don't. And if this is what the world is searching for, these are the leading minds of our time, then will wisdom ever be found by those following these minds? The answer is no. How does God's or man's definition of wisdom compare with God's? Where can we go to discover such a thing? Well, one really simple place just to compare the two is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. Tells us everything we really need to know. It says, do not deceive deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. Uh Uh-oh, that's like the opposite. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. Yep, that definition I just read you. Foolishness in God's sight. He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. Now today we're going to look at the book of Proverbs, put one passage out to discuss this very topic. The book of Psalms that we just got out of is a, very similar to the book of Proverbs. They're both actually books of poetry, if you didn't know that. Psalms is a song book, whereas Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And this amazing collection of wise sayings are as true today as they were when they were written by King Solomon thousands of years ago, because you see, wisdom doesn't change. Solomon was the king of Israel. He was the son of the great King David. One of the things I've always wondered, and especially as I was reading through just some extra Proverbs this week, is how many of these sayings, because a lot of them are just wise tales, if you will, sayings that Solomon wrote down. How many of these things did little boy Solomon, teenage boy Solomon, young man Solomon, did he hear from his dad, from David? How many of these things was he told time and time and time again? And he's finally like, all right, I'll write it down. I get it. Okay, I I understand. Now, to this day, Solomon has the reputation of being the wisest man who ever lived. Some of that wisdom would have come from life experience, absolutely, but not all of it. Truly, Solomon's wisdom was a gift from God. And that moment is recorded in 2 Chronicles 1-7. It reads this way. That night, God appeared to Solomon in a dream, and he asked him, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Imagine, if the God of the universe came to you today and said, hey, anything you want. Now, I know some people try to treat God like that genie in a bottle, but in this case, that's kind of what's happening. Ask for anything you want, and I will give it to you. Solomon answered, God, you've shown great kindness to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, let your promise to my father David be confirmed, for you have made me king over people who are as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I might lead this people for who is able to govern this great people of yours. 
That's an interesting request. God said to Solomon in verse 11, since this is your heart's desire, and you haven't asked for wealth, you haven't asked for possessions or honor, you didn't ask for the death of your enemies, since you haven't asked for long life, but instead asked for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people over whom I've made you king, well, therefore, wisdom and knowledge, absolutely. But I'm also going to give you wealth, possessions, and honor such as no king who was ever before you ever had, and none will ever have again. Wow. <laughs> that, that's it. Solomon could have asked for anything in the entire world in that moment, and he honored God and his position and his people, and he asked for godly wisdom and knowledge. And it says not only did God give him his heart's desire, wisdom, and knowledge, but God piled on wealth, possessions, honor, and more. Why? Why? Because he sought what was good and right in the eyes of God. I think for all of us today, there could be a very valuable lesson to learn from Solomon's life in that moment. What are you currently asking God for in your life right now? We all have an ask. What is it? And I ask you, is that ask of God, is it in pursuit of him? Or is it in pursuit of something else? Because when you pursue him, so many times that something else just seems to chase right along with you. But you must pursue him first. Back to wisdom. This book of Proverbs is a result of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God upon the life of Solomon. This book might just be the original master class, to get trendy with our terminology, in wise living in this world. How wisdom can lead to success in personal relationships, even in business, in family life, in community, in your marriage, and more. Our key verse today, Proverbs 1-7, tells us one thing, where to start the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Some translations do use the word wisdom, and that's fair. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, these exact words are repeated two more times in the book of Proverbs. Why? Well, because we humans, we need a gentle reminder from time to time. And even as we're reading a book of wisdom, we need to be reminded of what, how that wisdom comes into play. But you know what? It's also in the book of Psalms. Hmm, David. It's also in the book of Job. Oh, even further back. There's a really basic principle that we like to repeat around here. It's a principle of studying scripture that comes into play. If it's repeated in God's word, then it's important. It's a very simple process. So let's begin by defining wisdom and that highly related word, knowledge. Knowledge is more than just book smarts. Getting the answers right on a test. You actually could be very, very smart and still be a fool. We've probably all met folks that fit into that category. The Hebrew word here used has to do with insight, understanding. The word for wisdom means skill and shrewdness. It's all combined into one. The ability to judge correctly the right course of action and based on the knowledge that you have and the understanding you've been given. The knowledge or the ability to make the right choices at an opportune time. As the passage suggests, the basis of this knowledge is the fear of the Lord. The person who pursues or seeks wisdom will receive, in return, understanding. Biblical wisdom goes a lot deeper than those earthly wisdom categories that psychology today listed for us. It's way more than just practical life lessons or moral life principles Understanding how life and how relationships really work and making the best decisions based on a proper understanding of the spiritual and moral realities of the life that we live. Maybe the best definition I read in looking up all of these was this. Listen closely. Wisdom is the quality that keeps you from getting into situations where you even need it. Wisdom is the quality that keeps you from even getting into situations that you need the wisdom. Interesting thought. The truth is that this passage really isn't about wisdom in self as de de definition. It's about where wisdom can be found. 
where it starts. Obviously, our lives are going to provide wisdom for us, but we must start in the right place. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, for me, as I read this passage, one of the things I immediately thought about was this. It seems like this shouldn't be what it says. So many other things could fit to be the beginning of knowledge. Why the fear of the Lord? Why isn't it the love of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom or knowledge? Why isn't it the knowledge of the Lord leads to wisdom? That makes sense. Or how about obedience to the Lord leads to wisdom or knowledge? Why isn't it any of those? How does wisdom arise from fear? You see, in our culture, we see fear as, as kind of a bad thing. Maybe even a sign of weakness in our lives. We don't want to be fearful. We avoid situations. We avoid people. We avoid events that bring us fear. Being fearless is often a trait that's admired in our culture, in humanity. But is that truly how God wired us, how he designed us? Is that, as who, is that who we are to be? Those of you that remember your high school health class or a biology class might remember that your body is actually hardwired to deal with fear, isn't it? You have a healthy sense of fear. You have an entire part of your brain devoted to responding to fear. Sin, however, has corrupted this truth, twisted good fear, if you will, into something harmful. Or destructive, causing us to fear the wrong things entirely. One thing that fear can bring out is our God-given instincts. Yeah, that fight or flight response. Do you remember studying that a long, long time ago, some of you? In class, hasn't changed. It prepares us to respond to all kinds of situations, and this is good. It's how we were wired. But what about when we're so overcome with fear or something unfamiliar or something uncomfortable? Should we run away from that? In my experience today in interacting with people and watching the news and reading articles, there are more and more instances where fear just simply leaves people paralyzed. They don't know what to do, so they do nothing. Remember that simple definition of wisdom earlier, the knowledge or ability to make the right choices at the right time. Proper fear gives you that ability. Let's look at good fear and bad fear. Hopefully all of us learn something very early in life. You learn a healthy fear or respect of, say, a hot stove, right? Somehow some of you learn how not to walk in front of moving vehicles, right? Occasionally over the course of your life since those moments, you have forgotten some of those principles and you know the result from that. But today, there, there seems to be an irrational fear that's set into people's lives, something that paralyzes them, paralyzes a person, alters maybe even their entire life. Now, some of those fears are legitimate. They're as a result of a life experience. Maybe you have been stung by a bee or you're allergic. Maybe you have been bit by a snake, and so now you're desperately afraid of them, okay? But in reality, a lot of these other things can be caused by trauma, in your life. This fear then as a result could be a protective device or a defense mechanism and that's fine. We understand that. But there are a lot of other fears that we humans have that are just there, well, because there's really no reason. Fear of things like dentists or birds or clowns or lizards or toads or numbers. There's no rational reason for many of those kinds of fears. And yet, they can alter a person's life. They can keep someone from getting the care that they need or enjoying an element of life that's meant to be enjoyed. These are bad forms of fear for sure. I found this list of comparisons between good fear and bad fear to help you just understand the difference. And I'll understand, I'll explain why it's so important here in a minute. Good fear asks a great question. What can I do about what is happening? Okay. Bad fear asks a bad question. What if this thing that I can do nothing about actually happens? That's where a lot of people sit paralyzed. What if? What if? Bad fear is being afraid of things that it doesn't need to be. Good fear respects, places fear and respect where it belongs. Good fear drives you 
Bad fear stops you. Good fear moves you. It gives you that extra adrenaline needed in a life or in a time of crisis or to accomplish a task or a goal. Bad fear paralyzes so you can't act even when you need to. Good fear inspires self-motivation. Bad fear crushes you with self-doubt. Good fear helps you do a good job. Bad fear helps, you, helps keep you from doing a job at all. Good fear focuses you on what matters most. Bad fear distracts you from what matters most. A good fear makes you more aware of what's going on around you. Bad fear blinds you to what's even going on around you. Good fear helps you in the short and long run. Of course, bad fear hurts you in both. I'll just point to the last few years. Have you not seen this played out in our culture beginning with COVID? The world stirs us up with bad fear, paralyzing fear. And that is why today's passage is so important. Why we must understand the difference between good fear and bad fear. This is why it's vital to understanding, to help us understand what the fear of the Lord means. Within the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, this phrase, the fear of the Lord, is mentioned 14 times. It's mentioned 13 other places throughout Scripture. Back to that, that, that one principle. If it's repeated, then um, it's important. So what does it even mean? We read it. We say it. Do we even understand what the fear of the Lord is? We must understand and define that word fear in this context. Now, like every other Hebrew word, there's lots of definitions for each word in English that we consider to be fear. The word specifically used in this context is yira. It's defined as a reverence, a fear, worship, awesomeness. It could be defined what we experience when we suddenly find ourselves in the presence of considerably more power than what we're used to. And when you apply that to God, that would be a holy fear. I'm going to read you about three or four different commentaries and how they define it. So important because each one of these you might hear differently. And we want to make sure that we all walk away from here having a healthy knowledge of what the fear of the Lord is. But the fear of the Lord, it is the, that in affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his father's law. It is a worshiping submission to the God of the covenant. The fear of the Lord ultimately expresses reverential submission to the Lord's will and thus characterizes a true worshiper. The fear of the Lord signifies a religious reference which every intelligent being owes to his creator. It's a response when we realize intelligence, when we think about who God truly is, how great, how awesome, how magnificent he is, it's our natural response. A simplified version of this actually has taken place probably in many of your lives. When you yourself were put in in front of someone famous or someone powerful, maybe a superior of yours at your place of employment or a CEO of a company, We experience something maybe that is just breathtaking. It's so awesome when we experience or see it. We might become tongue-tied or just remain silent because we don't have the words to speak. A proper fear of the Lord views his presence in a similar way, just on a much bigger scale. A proper fear of the Lord doesn't cower over in the corner, but please don't misunderstand You're not running up to God and just giving him a high five either. Not initially. There's a healthy reverence for that position, that awesome God that's in control. Remember, it's because of God's mercy through Jesus that we read about actually last week in Proverbs 4.16 that says we can now approach God's throne of grace with confidence. But keep in mind, Paul reminds us in Philippians 2.12 that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. There's a healthy balance between those two things in our view of our God. So I'm going to end today by giving you three reasons that I found for why fear is so important to opening this door to wisdom. The first, fearing God opens the door to his love. 
So you can never truly, properly experience God's love if you don't also fear him in this God-fearing way. It is impossible to grasp the height, the depth, the width of God's love without first understanding how great and awesome he truly is. Without a healthy fear of the same awesome greatness. Now that might not make sense at first. You're right. Because 1 John 4, 8 tells us that perfect love casts out what? Fear. Wait a minute. How does all this work together? Well, let's start with the 1 John passage. He's not talking about godly fear. He's not talking about the fear of his creator. He's talking about bad fear, unholy fear. The fear that comes when we fear others, other things more than we fear God. It's irrational. It's a bad kind of fear that we were talking about. The Bible also talks about a holy fear, a godly love working hand to hand. Love and fear are not opposite ends of the spectrum when we're talking about God. They work together. Psalm 33, 8 says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere or stand in awe of him. Verse 18 and 19 say, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. All those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Wait, our unfailing love, our hope in Christ is began by our fear of his awesome Greatness, our respect for who he is. The experience of his love is brought on by our holy fear of who he is. Now, don't hear me wrong. This does not mean that God doesn't love you unless you fear him. That is not true. But it does mean that you and I can't fully feel and experience his love until we do. Psalm 103, 11 declares for us, High as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Did you know those were tied together? The experience of God's love preceded by the fear of his awesome character. A holy fear of God is the key that unlocks the door to experience his love. If you have no fear of God, his love and kindness will mean very, very little to you. The higher your reverence, your awe, your respect, your fear for this great God, the greater the experience of his love. How could he love us the way he does? It's incredible. The great truth is often portrayed in the lives of parents today. Parents who miss this truth because they just want to be their kid's best friend. They, they don't want to be the authority figure in their life. They don't want to provide discipline and structure in their life. They forget that healthy fear is fueled by respect and awe, and it must precede that experience of love. The Bible often uses the father-child relationship to describe this dynamic. Psalm 103, 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Huh. In chapter 14, that first part that you'll read this week in your book, the author, Mark Moore, shares this with you. The same image comes from chapter 14. Remember when you were a kid, or maybe you had kids, and your father threw you as high as he could up in the air. That very strength that launched you into the air also was the strength that comforted you when there was a monster under your bed. A God that isn't big enough to fear isn't a God that's big enough to save. Think of that dad throwing their child several feet into the air. It terrifies mom. And if grandma's around, it gets real serious. But it brings such joy to the child who cries again, again. The child's delighted. Why? Because they trust their father's power completely. They rest respect his strength fully. They trust their daddy's greater than, that he's not going to, than the great, it, her daddy's strength is greater than the fear that that child has of being dropped. But that's why mom's terrified because mom knows dad isn't perfect and could possibly drop said child. But here's what happens over time. That baby grows up. That baby that loved being thrown in the sky and fully trusted in their parents changes mentally as they become a teenager. And at least for a few years, they lose all respect so many times for their parents. 
in particular, their father. He's gone from he can do no wrong to they can never be right. And as long as that child has no respect or healthy fear of their father, they're going to be numb to his love and kindness. They'll receive no delight in that relationship. And the same is true of our relationship with God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, because it opens us up to his love. You'll read that from Mark this week. Second, fearing God makes you fearless. What? Fearing God makes you fearless. The fear of God keeps all the other things of this world, all the other fears of this world at bay. When fearing God tops your list, then all the other fears fall into their proper place. It's interesting that all the times in the Bible that it tells us to fear God, I just gave you those numbers a little bit ago, do you know what the number one most often repeated command in all of the Bible is? Fear not. Do not be afraid. They go together. Yeah. It's around 70 times that command to not be afraid is there for us. You see, when you fear God, you will fear nothing else. You realize that most of our struggles with fear come from the fact that we're fearing the wrong things. Our fear priorities are all messed up. Overcoming fear isn't about not fearing the wrong things. No. It's about learning to fear the right thing. When we realize that God is bigger than everything else that we're afraid of, there's nothing left to be afraid of anymore. Fearing God makes us fearless. Third, fearing God fosters and advances holiness in our lives. Now, how does that work? It inspires obedience. Fearing God inspires obedience. And that's not because you're afraid of punishment. Healthy, perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. That's 1 John 4.18. But there is something about that. When we fear someone, we obey them. Gentlemen in the room. Did any of you have a healthy fear of your father growing up and it kept you out of a lot of trouble? Mm -hmm. I did. Absolutely. There's a lot of things I probably could have done in life, but I wasn't going to do it because I didn't want to get in trouble. What do you do for those who are like, nope, that's not me. Okay. What do you do when you look in your rearview mirror and you see a police officer? Instinctively, what do you do? Slow down. Even if you're already going the right speed, you slow down. Some of you are like, "Uh uh-oh, I don't have my seat mount on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you try to smoothly put that on, stop texting Quit doing it anyway while you're driving. Anyway, it's not safe. We all do it. We all double check those things. Why? We're making sure that we're obeying things. Why? Because fear inspires obedience. That's why. Now, I know some of you are objecting to this whole idea saying, hey, but shouldn't we obey God because we love him and not because we fear him? Yes, yes, and yes. And ultimately, you grow into your faith. You grow in your faith. And love becomes the primary motivator. But remember, fear and love work together. They're partners. Being motivated by fear does not exclude being motivated by love. And if you'll go back with me to the beginning passage from today, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning, not the end. It's the starting point. It's where we all must begin. Fear isn't the whole story. That's a big part of one of the songs that we often will sing around here that so many of us love. It isn't all about fear. It doesn't begin and end with fear. If you're still in a relationship where you're with God where you're only afraid of God and punishment and being sent to hell, then you haven't got a mature faith yet. That's a great starting point. It'll get you to believe in Jesus, but that's not where it ends. That's only the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. The one thing fear absolutely does is it fosters holiness. It motivates us to do what we should do. And when we obey and we make wise choices, well, that's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord isn't something we need to downplay. It's not something we need to run from. It's something we as followers of Jesus should embrace. It's how we enjoy his goodness. Psalm 34, 8 and 9 makes this very clear. This is a very famous passage that probably a lot of you have heard. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Oh, we all hear verse 8. We know that part. But do you know verse 9? Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. 
Those two go together. You can't separate them. You can't have one without the other. Did you ex- hear that fully? You cannot experience his goodness, his refuge, and his supply without first having a healthy fear of who he is. Fearing the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As a follower of Jesus, we are called to become more and more and more like him, to better know him, to better know his ways. So there is more we must do as our relationship grows. If you want to grow in your wisdom, once you get past that fear and you've begun that knowledge, there's a lot of ways. And one of the most repeated ways to grow in wisdom is to be humble. Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 15, 33, wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord. And humility comes before honor. (laughs) Wisdom is increased. The more teachable that you and I are, the better we accept instruction, the more wise we become. Proverbs 9, 9, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. Proverbs 15, 31, whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. See, wisdom does not come easy. We must pursue it with diligence. We got to work at it. We got to be persistent in it. There's so much in this world that will lead us astray. (laughs) Oh my goodness. And we can lose wisdom very quickly when we follow those paths. Proverbs 8, 17, I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. Proverbs 2, 4 and 5. And if you look for it as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. See, folks, it doesn't just happen by itself. Meeting together on a Sunday morning is the beginning. We must then go out and search for it diligently. And he promises when we search, we will find. The more that we understand and follow God's ways, his commands, the more wisdom that we're going to gain. Proverbs 2, 7, he holds success in store for the upright, the honest, the respectable, the moral. He has a shield to those whose walk is blameless. One final thing, our faith plays a role in wisdom as we mature in it. Do we truly believe? Do we really believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and gave it up for you and for me in our sins? He never sinned, but was taken to the grave because of our sin. He rose three days later. He was ascended into heaven, and one day he will come back for all of his followers. Do you truly believe that? Have you trusted him with your life fully? Trusted him with your life? Because if you do, listen to this promise from James, the half-brother of Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you're trying to find discernment in this life, you're trying to live this life, you're trying to figure things out, where's your faith? Check it first. And once you confirm that faith and that belief, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe. Don't doubt because the one who doubts is like the waves of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, James isn't saying you don't have questions. James isn't saying, man, I don't know about this or that. James is saying when you have questions, seek answers. Don't just sit on those questions. Too many people just doubt, and then they walk away. They never ask questions. They never look for answers. They just doubt. James is challenging us to ask God our questions. On one last note, there is a problem. There is a problem with this passage even. You can have all the God-given, literally God-given wisdom in the world and still be led astray. Just ask Solomon, the one who recorded these very words for us. God gave Solomon his very own wisdom. But what did Solomon do? Well, Solomon abandoned his relationship with God. Oh, he still had the wisdom, and he still used the wisdom, but he abandoned that relationship, that pure relationship with God to pursue the things of this world, and they led him astray. 
They led him to write things like this in Ecclesiastes 1, 2. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Does that, are those wise words? No. Those are the words of someone who doesn't have that wisdom connected with that fear of the Lord any longer. The wisdom that flows from God through that relationship with him that we can have with Jesus is one of the greatest blessings that we have access to in this life. And it's one of the things that God is more than willing to give out to anyone who asks because he knows the benefit it will bring to his kingdom, to reaching and seeking and saving the lost. He wants to give this freely to you. So where is your relationship with Jesus today? I would contend that probably 90% of the people in this room believe in Jesus today. That's awesome. Where is your relationship with Jesus today? Where is that fear of Jesus today? That fear of the Lord that leads to this wisdom. Are you pursuing him? What is your ask of Jesus today? When you prayed this morning or last night, what did you ask of him? Is that ask for your benefit? Or is it to benefit others, to benefit the kingdom of God? Maybe you're like, hey, I don't know this Jesus yet. Great. Can't believe he has you here. That's awesome that the Spirit led you here to hear about this Jesus, who you've got to understand is this great, magnificent, incredible creator of this universe, but he's not some wizard hiding behind a curtain. He put you together in your mother's womb. He knows you intimately, and he loves you anyway, (laughs) and he loves me anyway. Come to him today and realize and experience that love for Jesus. Father God, as we close this part of the service and we open it up to your spirit to continue to move in this place. We know that there are those here struggling. And Father, the fears of this world may be right on the edge of overtaking their lives. And Father, I'm so thankful that you have them here so they can learn that that is not the kind of fear we are to have of you. That, Father, our fear of you is developed out of our love for you, that we understand who you are, how magnificent you are, how great you are, and we have this respect when we come before you. But, Father, that same respect, that same fear that we have needs to be measured with the understanding that you sent your son to this earth to come to us, to save us, so that we could lay aside those fears and come before you freely with our sin with our guilt, with our shame, with our pain, with our questions and seek godly wisdom for this life. Father, if there's those here today struggling, would they please, we've got a team waiting to pray with them. If there's people today who have have grown up in Christ and they've lost that healthy fear, respect for the Lord and they just live life day to day like they're the ones in control, then maybe today is just a reminder that you are the one in control And that whatever we're doing to try to to control our lives and our atmospheres and our work and our savings and everything else going on, we need to put that back in your hands because we're going to mess it up. (laughs) And we can trust you. Father, maybe there's some that have just never truly understood. Maybe the world has told them time and time again, they're not smart enough, they're not good enough. They didn't achieve well in school and so now they're left Father, you don't have that feeling. You just ask that they pursue you and you will then bless them with the knowledge, the wisdom that they need in this life to first and foremost love you, to love others, to serve others. And you will use that to make their name great in your kingdom, the only one that matters. Father, we love you. We thank you again for your presence here today and this blessing of wisdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So I have no doubt this next song was God-ordained because this song is called We're No Longer Slaves to Fear, the bad fear that Chris was talking about. So if you guys would please stand, we'll sing this together this morning. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with the song of deliverance, 
from my enemy till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear, and I am a child.
You guys will be seated for a moment as we take communion. Well, as we've been talking about this morning, uh, we're just saying about we are not slaves to fear because we are children of God. And we are children of God because of the great grace that he offers us. And that's what I'd like to talk about this morning. In Colossians 1.6, it says, The gospel is bearing fruit and growing, as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Do we really understand God's grace? Um, understanding it, maybe easy enough, but do we truly um, understand it and apply it in our lives? As we gather around the Lord's table, uh, we seek to understand grace, and we're reminded that Jesus Christ himself is the agent of God's grace and allows us to be reconciled with him. Paul explained it this way, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. We truly understand grace when we yield to the transformative power that accompanies it. For Paul, that happened when he realized that he was the worst of sinners, and he understood that God's grace was sufficient. For us today, it might be that we realize that we can't save ourselves, and in our gratitude, we yield to the will of God. We understand that grace is necessary. As we approach the table, we focus on Jesus Christ, who took upon himself the penalty for our sins, so that we are transformed by God's grace and truly understand it. You can take the bread and drink from the cup. Once you've had a moment to take communion, I'd love to invite you to singing the last couple songs. Um, the Spirit's really laying in my heart today that um, some we I know some of us are struggling in this holiday season, but that doesn't always that doesn't mean God's not good. And um, I just don't want to know want you to, to to hear that today. Um, if you guys would please stand, we're going to sing some songs to Him.
is yours.
Um, there is no blast tonight because of the holiday weekend. So I'll miss all of you, and I'll see you next Sunday night. Uh, we've got uh, God and My Girlfriends coming up December 8th. God gave me... <laughs> The scripture to read a few weeks ago, and every Sunday it wasn't time. So today he said, I want you to try to read it because he knows how I do on stuff like this. So I'd like to close with this. <laughs> Crazy, I've never noticed at the top of it, it says Thanksgiving and prayer. I guess that's why it's for this week. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day. Until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For the, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Have a good week.